Amen. Today, I've entitled today's sermon, Rewind and Anatomy of Enemy Kingdoms, right? And why are we doing a bit of a rewind? It is not to do a mid-year uh, catch-up. Uh, I think that last year, we, last week, we did a kind of a review of our year thus far. And later this afternoon, I'll be gathering uh, the leaders right here as well to do a deeper level, leadership level uh, review of the first half of the year. But this today is a rewind on our pulpit series going through all the entire narrative of the Bible. How many of you, lebe kurang, you have been here since the start of the year, okay? And you have somewhat been tracking this, bi- this pulpit series. Just give me a, a big wave. Uh, give me a big wave. If lebe kurang, you've been here since the start of the year, right? Okay, good. You can put your hands down. For those of you uh, who are not waving uh, at me, then let me give you a bit of a... Lord, in fact, it's a great day for you to be here because today is a bit of a recap. Right? right here on the screen is, I guess, the closest I can do to a visual summary of the entire story of the Bible. And that's something we committed to doing from the pulpit this year, is to take everyone through the entire narrative of the Bible, not book by book. We would never finish uh, um, that pulpit series if we went book by book, but through the key seasons, through the key narrative points in the story of God's people. And it all begins with a good creation. God creates a good universe, a good world. He creates good people to steward after good things. And then the two good people whom He creates fall. They decide that they will self-determine what constitutes good and what constitutes evil. And in their self-determination, the world which was beautiful and good in its original state shatters. And so, since then, we live in a fallen and sinful nature. And from there on, it's just cycles of downward spirals and then periodic moments of rescue and restoration that lead to more cycles of downward spirals. If you are newish to our church and you want to get the slides on your mobile device, you can look at the chair in front of you and you can scan that QR code and one of the first few buttons will say today's sermon, right? Sermon slides. And so you can access all the slides right there on your mobile device. You don't have to take pictures of the screen and so on, okay? By the way, a lot of bonus content for you uh, 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 today so you quite definitely want, if you are a nerd, you will definitely want today's deck. Now, so what happens, right? I said cycles of downward spirals. We have the violence that leads to Noah's flooding to reset. We have the clustering of the people's refusal to scatter, right? They cluster around Babel and try to build something and make a name for themselves. And then, and then God has to reset one more time. Eventually, God finds a man, one faithful guy from Ur of the Chaldeans. His name is Abram. And he brings him out and he says, I'm going to separate you from what is normal. I'm going to separate you from what is con- from what is comfortable. I'm going to separate you from what is familiar, from all the normal structures that surround you. I'm going to take you out and I'm going to lead you to walk to a place that you have no clue about and every step of the way, I will reveal to you the next. And by your faith, I shall account to you righteousness. And that's what God does. He gives Abraham a promise that he's going to be a father of nations. But... He's old. His wife is old. They have no children. What happens, right? By God's promise, eventually, this little fa- this couple, old elderly couple, have, a, at the end of it, two sons, right? One of the sons ends up with two other sons. And then one of those sons ends up with 12 sons. And then that, those 12 eventually become tribes. And the tribes become nation of people. But they end up in Egypt as slaves to a wicked pharaoh. And for 400 years almost, they are enslaved in Egypt as a nation of slaves. Eventually though, God leads them out. God raises Moses. He leads them through the Exodus out into a land that they would call their own and they start taking conquest, but not after 40 years of wandering around the desert. God takes them on that journey, right? And then once they enter, they have conquered. Their land is theirs. 
Is everything going to be good? It's good for a short while before they start to degenerate and re become to degenerate and go, and go on a new tailspin, right? Of downward spiraling and absolute chaos unleashes. In the book of Judges, you can see those stories, right? Of one layer of immorality after another. Eventually, they say, Oh, God cannot already give us a king. They get a king, they get King Saul who is patchy at best, right? And then after King Saul comes King David, who is a breath of fresh air. And so much of our scriptures that we have today are owing to David's faithful heart before God. But eventually, the kings also replace each other with really bad ones. And one more cycle of downward spiral begins before two, the nation splits into two. The northern kingdom is totally absorbed into Assyria and they're gone forever. The southern kingdom ends up exiled in Babylon, but not before God reaches them through prophets and tries to woo them back and say, come back to me and no disaster will befall you. But they do not come back to God and disaster does befall them. As a nation, they collapse, they are exiled into Babylon and after 80, 70 years, they finally get to come back. Wiser, more sober, having experienced the trauma of exile, and you would think that things would go well from here on. But not quite. And people start oppressing the poor again. And then many of the men take foreign wives all over again. And then those who decided that we're going to take our religion seriously, take it so legalistically seriously that they take it too far and start using the structures of religion to oppress the people. It's almost as if there is this thing inside them that will not die. They just keep trying to kill it and it comes back again. How many of you guys enjoy watching horror films? How many of you guys like watching horror films? No, okay, okay. Your pastor did film studies and he wrote papers on horror films, okay? So you don't have to be like, you're in church, I dare not confess, right? Okay? How many of you like watching horror films? Raise your hands. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we got a handful, okay? Now, I used to love watching horror films, right? I told you I wrote a paper on it, right? Um, the idea behind horror films is that the source of horror never dies. Right? It keeps coming out. And no matter how much havoc it wrecks in, the, in one film, right? just as you're resolving it, you know, and then everything is calm and like, you know, the, the, the girl drives off into, you know, into, in, into the horizon and everything is okay already, you know, and then just in the last frame, bang, and then finish, right? You know this, right? It's a typical horror film thing. Now, why do horror film filmmakers do that? Well, the commercial un re answer is they do that because you can do a sequel, right? When you, when, when you don't let the Freddy Krueger die or the whoever die, right? Then you've you got a sequel left, right? You can make more money, you can milk the franchise. But the reality is, deep down inside the psyche of the human is that the horror never goes away. It keeps coming back. No matter what you do, you can't seem to stamp it out. It's like those... I don't know, cockroaches? You can like nuclear bomb a, a city and the cockroaches don't die, right? It's like, you just can't kill these things, right? And so the reality is it's speaking of something really, really primal about our human nature, right? Then on that level, I, I appreciate what horror films do culturally, right? They tell us about, the, they tell stories about the primal horrors that never go away. That's what's happening here. It does not go away. And the people continue to wait and wait and wait for a Messiah who would save them. And eventually, God sends them one who would make all those horrors go away. No one else could. No one else has been able to until Jesus. And Jesus comes, right, to bring about a kingdom. He goes to the cross for our salvation. The Spirit falls on His people after His resurrection. And the church is born, and here we are today, the church. We are living in this second last square, right here. That's where we are in biblical history. And we will go on like this. Some people believe it will be within our lifetime, and it may well be. But many people who have come and gone believed it was also within their lifetime, and it was not. And so we want to soberly be ready because that's what Scripture tells us. Be alert and awake at all times, right? But it may well be 
many, many more years, many, many more decades, maybe even many more centuries. We have to be humble enough to accept that we don't know. That's why Jesus says, I will come like a thief in the night. You just cannot calculate and predict it. But the day will come when He comes to roll this whole thing up and bring the powers of darkness and evil to ultimate account. And God will come clashing against the powers of darkness and only one will prevail. His love never fails, never gives up, never runs out. Amen? And God's power will defeat the armies of darkness at the apocalypse and a new Jerusalem comes down from heaven and all of His people will enter to live forever with Jesus. Is that a good story? Is that a good story? We'll spend the whole year trying to tell this story and zooming in and zooming out, you know, and every time we preach one of these, each box represents a sermon. So if you uh, would like to zoom into each one of those boxes, you can go to our YouTube and watch it. Today, we are in between anticipation and kingdom. We finished season one at the anticipation. I shared about the intertestamental period until the birth of Jesus and the expectation that the people had for the coming Messiah. And today is really a bonus sermon in this series. It's sermon number 19 actually, about just to recap and rewind. But I was thinking about this. How do we recap this series from a fresh angle? And the answer is to recap this series from the angle of looking at not just the earthly kingdoms, but the enemy kingdoms, what's happening underneath the powers of darkness that seek to keep curtailing or keep uh, 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 messing up, right, uh, the inner workings of God's people. Why does it keep falling apart? Today is about an anatomy of that thing. But first, before I progress any further, I just want to tell maybe a couple of stories. Um, this week was a crazy, crazy week um, with lots of unexpected things and it was exactly a week ago today that our sister Sherry put me aside after the service and said, uh, Pastor Fergus, um, I have a cousin uh, who is... Who, who is not doing well. She's in hospital. Um, she's, she's battling cancer. It's probably at the end stage. And her name is Claire. I've been given permission to share this. Um, and Claire's organs were, you know, you know, end stage cancer, what you can look like. And so uh, I was telling Sherry, can, 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 we'll go. She said, if she needs a wake done, can you do it? I said, can, Sherry, don't worry, we'll do it, right? Can you, she also wants to come back to the Lord. She wants to be baptized. Can you come to the hospital and baptize her? I said, Sherry, can, can. Let's arrange for our time, okay? And so I uh, waited for Sherry to come back uh, 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 with, with a date and uh, she texted me, right, and said, Wednesday afternoon, can? Wednesday afternoon, we'll be there, right? So I brought Chumpo along with me, went on Wednesday afternoon, you know, met her, was expecting her to be really frail, couldn't really speak, but to my surprise, she was relatively strong, at least compared to what I had in mind. Her voice was steady enough, but what struck me the most was that she had this little spirit, this spirit to, 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 to return to God. And she was very, very, very enthusiastic about wanting to get baptized, you know? And so we baptized Claire. You know, you know like hospital, you know, you can't like, oh, bush, you can't do all that, right? So, um, so I uh, cup some water and pour on her head, you know, and I asked her, I asked her these two questions as we asked all our baptismal candidates, right? Um, do, you, uh, do you profess Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior and your King, right? And she said, yes. And I asked her, do you vow to love Him and serve Him all the days of your life? And she said, yes. And the reality is, I had no clue when I asked her all the days of your life what it meant. But later that night before 11 p.m., Claire was taken home to the Lord. And when I got the text from Sherry, I could hardly believe it. When I saw it, I thought, what, what struck me the most was the timing. See, the timing of it was like, if we had, I was just telling Sherry, you know, we didn't even have a margin of half a day error. No half-day margin for error even. Because if we did, she would have gone home to the Lord, right? And so I'm just, I'm just, uh, 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 um, just quickened in my spirit to share this with you. Why? Because number one, it's so important to get right with God. And number two, even more important, is to just remember that Claire, who had 
by her own confession, had spent many years just wandering, drifting further and further away from God. In the very end, wanted to come back to God. And it reminds me that no matter how far you run, when God calls and you have a heart to respond, he, the, all the barriers fall and all the distance closes up and He brings you home. And in that moment, in that window between her falling so sick and then getting baptized and then just in the final hours before she left this world, what happened was a transference out of the dominion of darkness to the dominion and the kingdom of the beloved Son. And we see this. We see this happening in Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 verse 13 says, He has rescued us, He being Jesus, has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son He loves. In Him, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Amen? And so it is in Christ that Claire had, had salvation, redemption, forgiveness of sins, and the same applies to all of us. Don't worry, I'm going to get to the kingdoms of this world shortly. But why is it so important to know this, that all of God's work here while we are in this life is about the transference? Somebody turn to the friend next to you and say, transfer. Transfer. Right? You can get a job transfer, you transfer money to each other, you transfer uh, uh, all kinds of things, football season, summer, players are transferring left, right, and center. But the most important transfer is the transference from the kingdom of darkness and the dominion of darkness to the kingdom of the beloved Son Jesus. That's the transfer we must all go through. Amen? And I like how uh, uh, Colossians 1 has expressed it. It's not just transference from one king to another, one slave master into freedom. It is transference from dominion to dominion, from kingdom to kingdom, from government to government, from power to power, from lordship to lordship. That's what it really is. I listed down 80 of the most prominent biblical villains. Because I think we all know the biblical heroes, right? Okay, okay. So let's just do something different, okay? 80 of the most prominent biblical villains, some of it um, look like repeats, but they are really new versions of the old thing, you know? Um, and I'm, is it a bit small? Can I bump it up just a little bit, okay? Just a little bit, just a little bit, okay? Like 5% bigger, right? I'm going to read through the whole list. I might pause here and there to, to explain one or two. The serpent, we all know about the serpent, right? Okay, that's the first biblical villain, right? Is the serpent. By the way, I've included some anti-heroes as well, okay? Yeah, um, we'll get to them. The serpent, Cain, right? The Nephilim children, you know, we, we had one sermon on that, right? Ham, Nimrod, who was the leader of the, of the Tower of the Babel, Tower of Babel movement, right? Job's friends, yeah, remember the four of them, three, them plus one, right? Oh gosh, they, they are quite villainous. This guy called Kedolauma and a whole bunch of other kings. These are the guys who, who stole Lot and took him away. And then Abraham had to gather his people and go fight them back, you know, and get Lot back, right? That's Kedolauma. Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot's daughters. You know, the, the, they, they were quite sus, right? Um, Hagar and Ishmael, right? And, and I feel a little bit sorry for them because they, they, they were tools in part of a husband-wife, you know, issue. And, but they are often presented in some, I guess, some weird villainous way, okay? Esau, Jacob. Jacob's a villain. Uh, well, spent a big part of his life being a villain, okay? Yeah. Laban, right? Shechem. Who's Shechem? Shechem is the guy who, who raped uh, the, Jacob's daughter, right? And then, uh, and then two of the sons went and slaughtered his whole, his whole yeah. Well, two of the sons, right? Joseph's 11 brothers. Potiphar's wife. I didn't put Potiphar. I feel that Potiphar's a little bit of a weak character. But Potiphar's wife certainly is uh, strong and villainous. The Exodus era Pharaoh. The, ex the Exodus generation Israel, right? That's the complaining Israel, right? Okay. What else do we have? Aaron during the golden calf issue, right? Um, Balak. Balak, who was the king of the Moabites, who, who, who hired this uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Balaam to curse Israel. Second column, Og and Sihon. These are the two kings on the other side of, of, uh, of the Jordan. The Canaanite kingdoms. I just lump all of them together. Like, all the Canaanite kingdoms. Like, okay, Gideon, the first of the 
anti-heroes, right? Yeah, yeah, heroic in parts, you know, and then anti-heroic in other parts, led the whole of Israel into idolatry at the end of his life. Abimelech, Gideon's son, who murdered 70 of his brothers, right? Jephthah, right, who, uh, who yeah, was a part hero and then sacrificed his daughter, you know, used needlessly. Samson, we know that guy, right? Could not control any, uh, zero self-control man, Samson. Judges era Israel, right? That's the one that descended into ultimate chaos. Eli and his sons, yeah, yeah. The sons who were sleeping around and, you know, taking all the meat that was meant for offering. The Philistines, uh, just lump all the Philistines together, right? Okay. Um, Goliath, Saul, King Saul, Joab. Joab is an anti-hero. Like one of my I have more, more fascinating anti-heroes because he's just got such a violent streak in him. But so loyal, right? So loyal, so violent. He was David's uh, commander of his army. Um, and he would kill people out of loyalty even in dishonouring ways. So he's, that, that put him on the map, right? Um, Nabal, this is the guy who refused David uh, 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 um, the land, right? Passage through. Michal, that's the, his first wife who mocked him when he was worshipping the Lord and dancing, right? And then there's Amnon, his first son who raped uh, his, one of his daughters. Absalom, who murdered Amnon, right? Uh, um, as vengeance for his sister's uh, 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 rape. And then later tries to dethrone the father. So he's definitely on the map. Shimei, that's the guy who was like walking past D David and like hurling curses at him the whole way. Adonijah, Adonijah is another son who late in life tried to. Uh, uh, and David as well and Abiathar is the priest who went across to the other side and betrayed him then the sons of, of Solomon Rehoboam and friends right oh the friends are like real villains right okay um, Jeroboam uh, and then there's Ahab Jezebel Gehazi Gehazi is the guy who, who wanted to make some money out of the out of the clothing right and then like and then tried to uh, bring bring the, the general back and like tell him, hey, actually got price one you know and then got some money from him you know um, who else ben Hadad. Ben-Hadad was the Syrian king who attacked Israel at a time of a famine and made the, ex the, the response to the famine even worse. And it is during that famine that you have the widow and the oil and the multiplication and all that, right? But the guy behind that was Ben-Hadad. That's Athalia, not my wife, okay? Um, but... <laughs> She she slaughters all her all her 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 downline, you know, so that she can stay in power. <laughs> Sena Sharib. Sena Sharib is the Assyrian, uh, the Assyrian uh, 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 ruler uh, who comes and mocks uh, uh, Israel in Jewish, right? In speaking uh, Hebrew. There's Jonah, who is an anti-hero. Um, there's Gomer, who is the wife of, of, of Hosea, right? Uh, Gomer was one of the last people. like, oh yeah, Gomer, let me add her in. That's why I slept so late last night, right? Um, Manasseh, Manasseh, not the, not the tribe Manasseh, but this was the king who led them into endgame Israel kind of idolatry. There is, who else? Exile era Israel, right? All the idolatry there. Hananiah, lesser known, but he was one of the prophets who was telling Israel, go to Babylon, no worries. One, two years come back ready you know and he was like he was like uh, 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 peddling false prophecy at the time. The whole of Babylon lah. And then there's Gog and Magog somewhere in, in Ezekiel's uh, uh, prophecies. There's Nebuchadnezzar uh, the main person you see in is uh, Then there's Belshazzar the one with the with, with the disembodied hand writing on the wall. There is Haman, right? The Tatinai. Tatinai is the guy who was threatening them when they are rebuilding the walls. Uh, rebuilding the, 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 the altar. And then Sanballat is the one who's threatening them when they are rebuilding the walls. It goes on, right? The return era Israel. And then the New Testament ones. Ngam Ngam Ho, the New Testament one all fit, fit into Herod the Great, right? This is the one who kills all the baby boys when Jesus is born. There's a devil during the temptation in the desert, right? I'm just going to give that character one specific role there, right? Um, turn the bread turn the stones into bread, right? That, that, the, yeah, that guy, right? Um, Caiaphas and all the Pharisees of the time. Judas Iscariot, how can he not be there? He's definitely there, right? Gospel era Israel, meaning this is the Israel that all collectively shout, crucify him, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. Ah, Kantoi, that one's sure on the board, right? Pontius Pilate and all the Roman soldiers who flocked Jesus, right? They are gone about. Ananias and Sapphira, the first, the first villains of the book of Acts, right? Is Ananias and Sapphira. It doesn't stop there. Saul of Tarsus, you know, he is one of very few who had a reversal. Huh? You look actually, a lot of these guys, Hancho means Hancho already. Huh? Yeah, there's no turning back one, okay? Um, but for Saul of Tarsus, 
there was a turn back. Yeah? Simon the sorcerer, this is the guy who wanted to pay money to, have, to, to be able to use the spirit power, right? And then there's Elimas by Jesus. That's the, that's the other sorcerer who, um, who was contending with Paul for the, for, for the spiritual power over one of the Roman governors, right? Um, there are all the rioters in Thessalonia, Thessalonica, more rioters in Ephesus, right? These guys wreck havoc everywhere. Herod Agrippa, this was the guy um, who everybody said, oh, you are like a god. And then he was like, <laughs> and, then, and then he died, right? His bowels broke open and he died, right? Felix and Festus, these were two uh, Roman fellows who left Paul to rot in prison for so long. Herod Agrippa didn't do anything, didn't help. He's like, yeah, yeah, just, you know. Actually, all these guys got power, one. They, they don't want to exercise their power only, right? And then there's, you go to the book of Revelation, there is the dragon, right? Uh, which is Satan. There is the first beast, which is the Antichrist. There is the second beast, which is the false prophet. And then the, the last villain in your Bible is the great prostitute. That's, that's uh, Babylon, right? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, that's, that's a quick run-through. I think it's about five-minute run-through of all the most prominent villains in your Bible. Is this your first time seeing this? Yeah? Okay? That's why you have to download it, okay? If you're nerdy, you have to download the, the, the slides today and keep it, right? Um, now, I saw this and I was thinking, I'm not happy with this. I need to resort all 80 names according to what is their chief sin. What is their... This, this fellow Bo Siang Ma, this fellow like bad in a different way from this guy, bad in a different way from all these guys. So I resorted all of them, okay? And so I, one by one, I was like, the serpent. What is the serpent's chief sin? Deception, okay? So it's deceptive, okay? The next one, Cain. What is his big problem? Violence, jealousy, okay, one of the two, right? So I sort out, okay? So there's one big category called fight God or fight God's people, okay? And you got all the enemy kingdoms all there, okay? There's the next biggest category will surprise you. It is violent people. The next most, I want you to take out all the, the, the big category of all the enemy kingdoms and all that. The next most prominent uh, trait of villains in the Bible are violent people. Surprising, huh? You would have thought it might be idolatry and all that. Idolatry comes in much later. And then the th in third place, it's the sexual sins, fellas, right? All your Sodom and Gomorrah, la, Lot's daughters, la, Shechem, la, all this, la, okay? It's all there, right? And then on page two, ah, you have those who in pride rule with oppressive power. These are a little bit different from the violent fellas. These are a little bit different from the fellas who just fight God. These are people who set up structures of government that are seek to dominate and exploit, right? Um, and you have all the names there. And then idolatry comes, right? Joint fourth in this list. And then deception. You have the serpent, Jacob, Laban, right? And all this. Then those who mock. Surprisingly high, huh? There's a whole category for mockers, huh? Yeah? Um, and then you have the lawless who, are, who have no self-control. So you have guys like Esau, Sukahati this, Sukahati that. And these are all the Sukahati, anything they like. One, Jephthah, Samson, Saul, you know, and uh, returning era Israel. And then, of course, those who betray and attack the people they used to love, right? There are those who are greedy. Judas is there, right? Gehazi is there. And Ananias and Sapphira are there. And there are those who abdicate. And I think that's an interesting category. Those who are in power can do good, but they actually don't exercise their duty to do good, right? You've got Pontius Pilate there, Felix Festus, you even have Jonah, right, who is there. And then, finally, you have those who are self-righteous. The Pharisees, Caiaphas, and Job's friends, right? They are the ones who are most similar to each other. And then you have those who profane holy things, Eli and the sons and Belshazzar. And then, Exodus generation Israel, those who complain so much and rebel, okay? This is a snapshot very quickly now, God's people have never been able to sustain a godly kingdom. No matter which God's people era, they've never been able to sustain it. They try, they try their best, right? Abraham's side, right? Grow into a nation, but that nation becomes so sinful, right? And that nation keeps fighting, fighting Moses, fight here, fight there, you know? This, I've shown you, right, over the course of this year, how the tribes became big, and then they, when they conquered, and that era, Joshua's era, we think that's, that's quite good, right? So very quickly, they descend into utter chaos, right? We think, oh, the kings was not bad, right? David was good. How many generations did that last? One and a half? 
David and half of Solomon. And after that, it all went into tailspin as well, right? And then when they came back, they were okay. They were okay. They weren't so bad. And then you just have to say, oh, uh, who's ruling them by the time the Bible story comes back in? Herod the Great. That's the kind of people who's ruling Israel at the time. So it's actually not that great as well, right? It just keeps falling apart. Where, do we, where, where can we go to get a picture of this, right? This is not Colossians 1. This is my mistake. What then are we Jews any better of this? Romans 3. Romans 3, right? So if you're taking notes, that's Romans 3. What then? You would think that actually if you got the law, you are given God's immediate presence, God leading you the whole way, you would think that's good. You would think that you have a huge advantage to be a holy righteous nation, wouldn't you? Paul says no. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, this stand in for all Gentiles, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. Romans 3. What's this trying to say? It is trying to teach us and remind us that we are naturally doomed, if you can say that, without Jesus, doomed to a downward trajectory of fallen sin, fallenness and sin. And if you want to learn more about that, you can jump into our YouTube and go to the Sermon on the Fall, where we go into what fallenness is like, what sinfulness is like, and how these things interact to result in all this. One more point, God's kingdom and enemy kingdoms have opposite DNA. We are just not alike because we don't share the same king. And I need you to sit in this for a moment. We don't share the same king. And because of that, we don't have the same substance. We are born out of different things. If you are born again, if you've been born again in the Spirit, then I can confidently say, my friend, you are born out of different substance. You belong to someone else. And in the Scriptures, it says that you have been bought with a price. You are not your own. Who owns you? Jesus owns you. He rescued you out of darkness. And because of that, you are His. And because you are His, you belong to the King who is not like the kings of the enemy kingdoms. And it says in Ephesians 6, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. I need you to be able to see that there is always an interplay between the, what's happening on earth and what's happening in the spirit realm. Do you believe that right now, wherever you are seated, there are spiritual realities contending over your attentiveness to the sermon? over your attentiveness and quickness to hear the Word of God, to even research, to think about a Bible. I can tell you, right now, in this hall, there is one of you who had a thought, I'm going to research this thing when I get home. And right now, where you're seated, there is a war over your mind. There is a war over your attention for what happens after church. And one part of the war is warring for you to go home and follow it through and research that thing that God is speaking to you and say, go deeper into it, carry it with you all the way into the 40 days because God is speaking and revealing truth to you. And there is a, reality, a spiritual reality over the very space that you are seated on right now where the enemy powers of darkness are trying to distract you, defile you, and take your thoughts away from it. And it will often throw very, very, very mundane things at you to just distract you first and then lure you away and you will never return back to the thing that you had in mind. Whatever that it was, if that is you, write it down, make it a note, and do not allow the enemy in. Amen? Amen. And it's not just for when pastor is preaching. It's for every moment of your life. Spiritual realities. I like to use this metaphor. If you can hold on to a zip, like can just everybody just imagine a zip, right, in front of you, and then you just pull it down. And if you just part it, there is a spiritual world behind every single thing we are seeing right now. If I were to pull one down right here, 
Will it be like, you know, <laughs> demons in hell? Or will it be something that's a power and goodness and love of God just shining through? I can tell you, you are responsible for the spiritual reality that is over you. You have been given the authority to pray over the physical space around you. You've been given the authority to transform the space around you. That's why our altar is called Dominate. Because we believe that when we pray, we dominate the atmosphere. We pray, we dominate. God dominates our hearts. And then through that, God has dominion over the earth. So that the spiritual reality around all of us will constantly be seeing the powers of God defeating and breaking down every single gate of hell. That's how all of this ties together. But let's take a moment and look at the anatomy of the DNA of enemy kingdoms, right? One of the things that you see a lot of, they just fight God, contend with God, turn God. Everything also fight against him. Fight against people, fight against him. Whatever Yahweh wants to do, they're always standing in their way and opposing and opposing. Now, I know that for us here, none of you are a dictator ruling a country that, that is fighting against God. Okay? It's fine. But sometimes there is this thing inside us that's maybe a little rebellious. Maybe I should have put rebellious inside here as well, right? That we just... Why? Maybe something is not settle in us. Maybe we are carrying disappointment with God. I want to be honest with you. Sometimes going through church, being brought up as a Christian, being all doing this whole thing, you're enough, long enough, you might end up with disappointment with God. And if you do, I want to encourage you to hang in with God so that these 40 days we can pray alongside you. And pray alongside you so that you can find healing and restoration in the midst of whatever disappointments you had. But whatever fighting that you've been doing with God, I want to encourage you, my friend, sister, brother, lay your weapons down. If God brought you here today to hear one thing, maybe He brought you here to say that, to hear, let you hear this. Lay your sword down. Stop fighting Him. Stop fighting Him. The Bible says every sword will be beaten into a plowshare and every spear will be twisted back to become a pruning hook. Have you heard that one before? It's in Micah. Why swords to plowshares? Why spears to pruning hook? So that every instrument of warfare and killing gets transformed into an instrument of harvest and fruitfulness. Amen? Swords into plowshares, spears into pruning hooks. Stop the fighting. If you're fighting God, lay it. The next category are the violent. And maybe most of you are like, Pastor, that's not me. I'm not violent. I'm a very nice guy. One. Yeah. I never, I, I, I never beat anybody. I would never touch a soul. Yeah. Yeah. I just flame them on internet. <laughs> I just, I just troll them, you know, on the comment section. That's all Jesus says. What? Jesus says what? If you are angry with your brother, if you say at them, Raka, you fool. Or maybe if you can modernize it, if you cancel your sister, then you murdered them in your heart. So violence is not just about physical violence and maybe some of us need to curb some of our physical violence. I'll leave that to you. Violence against animals, i let your conscience speak on it to you, okay? That, that, that's, that, that, one, uh, that one, I think the Holy Spirit can convert you better than I, right? But violence is also about the violence of your heart. That thing inside us that says, I'll get you. So we're all great here. Just get on the road and someone cut you, huh? Then you see that the violence begin, right? And we need to be careful because for so many of the villains of the Bible to be violent people, right, we should take stock and realize that actually where does violence reside inside me? Right? Do I have a posture inside me that hates very quickly, scolds very quickly, curses others very quickly? Do we have that? If we do, can we submit it to Jesus? Yeah? If that is you, you know, you know if it's speaking to you, and if it's you, submit it to Jesus. That's a sexual sin one, right? I can tell you as your pastor, I don't always wade into this territory, you know, because I, 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 actually I don't know why, 
Maybe I should do it more, right? But I don't. Maybe not enough. Why? God identifies so many times, so many people whom He calls harlots, whom He calls prostitutes. Why? Not because He's there to like, like, Perlikan people who are prostitutes. You, we know Jesus was the one who would restore the dignity of the prostitute. He would lift up the one who is caught in adultery as if only one person can have adultery with themselves, right? Where's the guy who was on the other side? It takes two hands to clap one right? How come the guy never got caught? And by the way, the people who went to catch, like, wouldn't they have seen the guy? Maybe they themselves are the guy. We don't know, Right? And actually, you read scripture, you can see one how sometimes gender relations are extremely stacked against women, one, right? And you see the picture of Jesus restoring the dignity of that woman, right? Now, so the way I want to approach this is not to come at you with this Bible and to thump you on the head and say, you sinner, you know, break up, you know, you sinner, move out, bomb, you know, and like, hey, that never transformed anybody, huh? Just so you know, it never transform anybody. But I tell you what transforms the anybody's. The Holy Spirit convicting your heart that your body belongs to Him. And you know, we, last week I shared with you a picture of the temple. The temple all joined together from Ephesians, all built upwards, right? Into kind of like this hollow tower. It's a picture. And then the Holy Spirit fills it. The Holy Spirit fills it the way fresh water pours into a jug. It fills it with goodness, nourishment, thirst-quenching mercies, and then it overflows. And that's the picture of the church. That is both the church and also you. Because when the Spirit of God fell upon us at Pentecost, you became the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so elsewhere it says in Scripture, your body belongs to the Holy Spirit to reside. Don't anymore use it for sexual immorality. No longer should you devote your body, and that includes your mind, that includes the images you conjure, the fantasies you have, it includes all of it, right? It's a total psychosexual thing, right? Okay? No longer shall you devote yourself to these things, but devote yourself wholly, W-H-O-L-L-Y, wholly to God to be holy, H-O-L-Y. That He fills you with the cleansing. And I can tell you, when you say to God, God, I'm just wretched and my predilections are so dark and, I, and I'm just so drawn to lust or drawn to sexual things or drawn to all these weird thoughts, you know, and that you come before God and say, God, I'm here. I'm a wreck. Can you change me? Can you transform me? And I want to say, if that's you, take these 40 days and just every day bring this before God and say, God, so much filth, can you cleanse me? And every day just keep coming back to God and say, God, so much filth, can you cleanse me? Cleanse me. Oh, Holy Spirit, fill me, cleanse me. And I want to pray alongside with you. I don't need you to confess. I'm praying alongside with you already, right? That God will lift you out of spirals of darkness the way He has all of biblical history. He will do it for you as well. So you've got all these things, right? Pride and oppressive power. They're small. If we wanted to go, we can go on and on and on. But what does the scripture say? It says, now is the time for judgment on this world. Now, the prince of this world will be driven out. It says, two chapters down, I will not say much more to you, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me. And it says again, elsewhere in John, the prince of this world now stands condemned. Who is this prince of this world? I told you, right? That because there are two kingdoms, there are two different kings, because we actually will never be like them, should never be like them because we belong to different kings. Our kingdom, having been transferred out of the domain of darkness to the kingdom of the beloved son, who's our king? The beloved son, Jesus Christ. And because of that, we have been given a new DNA. Romans 8 says that you have been adopted into sonship. And because you've been adopted into sonship, the spirit fills you to 
be able to articulate the call, Abba, Father, now you place your daughtership, you place your sonship because the Spirit has given you that utterance. And so your DNA is revived, it's transformed. You no longer have the DNA of the father of lies. Now your DNA is on the Father in heaven, the holy, righteous, good God. And as the final thing, God promises, God promises the coming, the coming. This is, this is 6 a.m. in the morning talking, yeah. Um, <laughs> God promises the coming of a permanent God kingdom. God promises that He will restore, finally, once and for all, a kingdom that is not like any of the other kingdoms that I've been presenting to you today. A, king, a kingdom that is not governed by domination and oppression. A kingdom that does not commit sexual sin. A kingdom that is not wrapped up in violent oppression of others that does not fight against the work of Yahweh, but it belongs to the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they shall be filled. Blessed are those who are pure in heart, they shall see God. Blessed are the meek, they shall inherit what? The earth. The kingdom belongs to those who, though you can withhold your ability to strike. You can strike. Some of you are really strong. I know you wanted to street fight, are loose. Any one of us will lose because you're really strong. But blessed are you when you can street fight but you hold back and you show love instead. That's like a picture of meekness, right? God says that there is a coming kingdom where the wolf and the lamb will lie next to each other. You know what that's a picture of? Those who can be predators choose to not be predators. Those who can kill hold back their power to kill. Instead, can lie with the one who used to be afraid of getting killed. Predator next to prey. Both lie next to each other. That's the picture of God's kingdom. It says here, there are so many. The entire span, the ending of Isaiah, from Isaiah chapter about 40, 49, 50, the early 50 chapters, all the way to 66, right? Is this progressive revelation of the new kingdom, the new cre recreation of God, of God's universe, right? And this is just one of the one of the peaks, mountain peaks of that whole long poem. And it says this, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy. Not this Jerusalem, huh? He's talking about the new Jerusalem that descends from heaven. I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people and no more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die a hundred years old and the sinner a hundred years old shall be a... And the sinner a hundred years old shall be a curse. What's he trying to say? It doesn't mean that your life will be finite. It's just poetic language to say that we're going to live so long so long in perfect wellness. They shall build a house and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. In other words, your labour in this new Jerusalem will be fruitful and good. It will not be sweat of your brow and how come my master is so slave master? No longer. You, imagine the thing you like to do the most. Imagine getting the chance to have all the time to do it. That's work. That's the redemption of work. Amen? Something like it anyway. So many broken kingdoms. But you know what? They all fail. Through biblical history, we have seen every single one of these kingdoms fall apart. But there is one who never fails. Amen? Can I have the worship team on stage? Jesus says, Behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. And today, 
as we're closing our time here together, I want to encourage you to know this, to know this one truth, that the many kingdoms of darkness, the enemy kingdoms that surround us, and either you are wrapped up in it, and you feel like a foreigner, you feel like a stranger in a strange land, you're in a workplace that is really toxic, you're in a, you're, you're in a community that is really dark, you live in a household where everyone is, is, is really like, oh my gosh, so bad, you know, and you feel like, God, when can I come out? When can I come out? And the Lord speaks over you encouragement. He says, every kingdom of darkness shall not prevail. It will all fail in the end. So if you're being oppressed or if you're going through a really difficult season because someone is making it really hard for you, I speak life over you on this morning that God will cause that kingdom to gagal. It cannot be fruitful. It will not last long. Every single enemy kingdom kept on failing. It just cannot fail. It just cannot succeed. Why? Because it bachanga with God's ways. God will not let it take root. Amen? Though for a moment it may seem as though they take root, it will never truly take root. But how does the king of our kingdom bring about victory? He brings about victory by announcing his kingdom and then going to his death in order to inaugurate his kingdom. Now, you and I would never in our wildest dreams have written the story with the king's enthronement being on a horrific cross. We never have been able to script that. But God did. He established His king by having him brutally tortured and hung out to die. That's our king. And meanwhile, all the kings of the kingdoms of this world watched on and said, what a loser. What a loser. Weak, lame, loser. And here we are, gazing upon the cross. We know He's not a loser. We know He's triumphant. We know that in, on the cross, He brought upon defeat of every power of darkness. And yet, can I submit it to you? On most days, on the surface, we forget. On most days, we forget. And we turn to the ways of the kingdoms of this world rather than the kingdom of Jesus in order to get ahead. And if that is you, in a moment, we're going to turn off the lights and I just want to give you a moment to come before God. How does our kingdom establish its king by death on the cross humble servanthood death of a criminal and then hyper exalted to the right hand of the father and his love never fails all the kingdoms of this world can fail the love of Jesus will never fail close your eyes. I want you to bring yourself before the Lord Jesus. And if there's something in your life you want to confess before Him, take this moment to confess before Him. Oh, oh your love never fails. Just bring it before God. He doesn't judge you. He wants to redeem you. He wants to restore you. Hallelujah. Just bring it before God. Just keep opening your heart before Him. Hallelujah. Oh, your love never runs. Your love never runs out on me. Oh, Jesus, oh, your love never runs, never runs out of me. 
Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on. Let's rise to our feet. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Oh, your love never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love, oh, your love. Never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love, oh, you never, oh, you never fail. Oh, your love, your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love, in death, in life. Your love, your love. Lord Jesus, your kingdom advances in love. Your kingdom advances through grace, by faith. Your kingdom advances out of compassion and kindness and mercy. Your kingdom advances because you love and your love never defeat is never defeated Father, I command every gate of hell to tremble and be cast down right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Every kingdom of hell over your church be crashing down in the name of Jesus Amen. right now. By the power of the blood of Jesus, every addiction right now fall in the name of Jesus. Amen. By the name of Jesus, every depression be lifted in the name of Jesus. Amen. Father, we declare, Lord God, the power of your love your love, invasive love. Go in, rescue, and lift out. Rescue. Rescue your people. Amen. Now may this love of God the Father, the love of Jesus on the cross, be with you and with the fellowship, the abiding fellowship, the chesed of God, be with you all the days of your life filling you to newness restoring you to goodness renewing you so that you can be fit for the works of God and He will renew you my friends oh may He do this work in you may the Lord bless you may the Lord keep you 
May the Lord turn His face to shine upon you and be gracious with you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. All of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Amen.